Good evening. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Sokolow. I'm the director of the McGillicuddy Humanities Center at the University of Maine, and I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, but first, a quick note. Please be aware that this event is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the center's YouTube channel. Okay, Karen Sieber joined the McGillicuddy Humanities Center as a humanities specialist in the summer of 2019. She comes from a background in public history, the digital humanities and nonprofit management. As a historian, she's consulted on a variety of award-winning history projects nationwide, from museum exhibits to PBS programs. Much of her work is centered around helping the public better understand, preserve, and share community histories using outside of the box methods. Since 2015, Karen's made it her one woman mission to increase awareness about the Red Summer of 1919, which is the term given to a nationwide wave of violence against African-Americans that year. She built the world's largest database and archive on that topic. It's titled Visualizing the Red Summer, which is now the most used classroom resource on the Red Summer in the United States. Her work has been featured or cited by the National Archives, the American Historical Association, the History Channel, the Zinn Education Project, and others. Sieber recently discovered a previously undocumented case of red summer violence here at the University of Maine, which was kept out of the press and university records until now. Tonight, she'll discuss building what she calls a rogue archive, her recent discovery of the incidents of violence on campus and parallels it holds to current events. She'll also discuss her work with students and how to think about campus as not just a neutral place where history is studied, but as an active, place where history is being made, forgotten, and at times erased. Tonight's event is co-sponsored by the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the McGillicuddy Humanities Center. Here is Karen Sieber. Thanks so much, Michael. Uh, I'm really glad that we have such a good crowd for tonight. I was a little worried holding something so late in the semester, but it is such an important moment in history, um, and it's quite a recent discovery for me. Um, and I just kind of felt that urgency to get it out now as soon as possible. So thank you so much for making time tonight to join me. I'm gonna get a PowerPoint up here. All right, can you see this? Good, wonderful. All right, so as Michael said, my name is Karen Sieber. I'm the Humanities Specialist at the McGillicuddy Humanities Center, um, but I come from a background in public history and the digital humanities. Uh, most of my research, while I'm known for this Red Summer research, um, is actually more so centered around the intersection of travel and education. Um, I really think that there's no better way to understand the nation than to hit the road on a road trip and visit sites in person and to do place-based learning. Um, so for me, that's, that's how I learn. Uh, so in 2013, I took a road trip throughout uh, the Southern United States, kind of a Southern culture pilgrimage. And uh, let's see here. And much of that pilgrimage, of course, was based on food. Uh, so making sure that I, you know, had my fill of, of barbecue and sweet potatoes and fried chicken and local delicacies like uh, Mississippi Delta tamales. Um, but ultimately the goal of this trip um, was to visit historic sites, um, places of culture. So um, on the left is Pomonkey's Juke Joint. I did a lot of civil rights sites that semester or that summer uh, visited sites of architecture and writer's homes. And uh, on the left is a, a coon dog cemetery. Um, almost anything that you can imagine related to Southern culture. Um, I hit the road in 2013. And every new place that I was, even if I knew, even if I was there for a very particular historical or cultural reason, there was always something new to discover about that place. And so that summer I was in Knoxville, Tennessee for the first time and was kind of keeping a travel blog at the time of the different sites that I visited uh, and happened to ask my Airbnb host about the history of the neighborhood that was around me because it was just a quite beautiful historic neighborhood and learned for the first time about the Red Summer. Uh, this was a term that I had never heard about before 
Uh, it's a term that was developed by uh, James Walden Johnson, the African American leader. Um, it's not in reference to the Red Scare and communism, as a lot of people think that it is. It's, the Red Summer is actually in reference to bloodshed. So there was this six to eight month period in 2019, a nationwide series of uh, attacks against African Americans um, that uh, kind of evolved in, in a variety of different ways. But one of these attacks was in Knoxville. Um, but as, so I'm on vacation, I'm in an Airbnb, all I have is my, my phone to look things up. And so I'm trying to like devour information about the Red Summer while I'm on this road trip. And I discovered at the time that there really wasn't much out there. Um, there was, whoops, sorry, I keep trying to advance slides the wrong way here. Uh, so this time period was very tumultuous for a number of reasons. Um, the war had just ended um, while African-American soldiers had seen combat before as Union soldiers and the colored troops um, a little bit during the Spanish-American War. World War I was the first major uh, war to really kind of elevate um, African-American soldiers and be able to put them in positions of power and leadership um, and really on the front lines. Um, this kind of newfound uh, place in society was a lot for people to deal with. You have to keep in mind that this is kind of the height of Birth of a Nation had been just released a few years earlier and was re-released in 1919. Um, there's increased tensions across America due to the first wave of the Great Migration. So there's huge amounts of African-Americans moving from the South to Northern cities. So there's now this competition with jobs with resources, with housing, um, and these underlying uh, ideas about race, um, especially in urban areas, um, these preconceived notions about where African-Americans should be able to be within a city, what place was black, what place was white, how far should African-Americans be able to advance in society? Much of the violence that summer was related to African-Americans that had seen some sort of success that year. So there was very little existing scholarship on it. Uh, my friend and colleague, Bill Tuttle, wrote a book in 1968 that is still the pretty much the main book that is used in classrooms to talk about the Red Summer. It's a fantastic book. I mean, don't, you know, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But at the same time, there's not been a lot of new scholarship on the Red Summer race riots since then. There's been a little bit in academic journals that's very city specific. So the riots that there's, um, now we know of nearly four dozen cities that had riots and lynchings and other events that summer, um, but there's really only a handful that have ever received attention. Uh, Chicago, Elaine, Arkansas, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, Washington DC had a little scuffle that year but the vast majority of these um, acts of violence against African-Americans that year are really largely, unkno largely unknown to most Americans. And no historian has ever tried to look at the summer as a whole. Um, and part of that is just due to space. How would you possibly write a book about a series of events that happened in nearly four dozen locations across the United States, each with their own unique factors and background to the story. There's just, there's no feasible way of fully telling a story. But I wanted to find a way of providing better access to the documents that did exist, as well as creating some data about these events so that other scholars could use that to then look into patterns um, across these events. What did rural events look like versus urban events? But there was a lot of things that, kept scholars from writing about it. Um, first and foremost, the term red summer that we now use was not used at the time. So if you were to do a search on like newspapers.com for a red summer, it's not gonna pop up anything um, because it wasn't what, it wasn't the terminology that people were using at the time. But because this also was a very uh, tumultuous period within labor history, just using, a wording like riot isn't necessarily helpful as well 
because there are so many other riots going on in the world at the time. Um, so how do we kind of parse through all of the historical material that's out there um, and provide better access? I knew that material had to exist across the country, um, but a lot of these institutions weren't even aware that they had the material. It was things that had been in boxes for years or they possibly knew of it as a local event, but weren't aware of its connection to this greater nationwide series of events. Um, very little of it had ever been digitized. So at 2013, if you tried to find images of anything related to the Red Summer, there was the same 15 or 20 things that were coming up time and time again. So I tried to figure what, what can I do about this? Why can't I just go get all of this material and make it available. Um, and at the time I was working, uh, building a community archive for a cotton mill village in North Carolina. I uh, was very much into spreadsheets and GIS and that kind of thing. And I knew of my ability as a historian to track down documents. Uh, and I knew too that because I'd worked a lot in copyright that there wasn't necessarily any legal reason why I couldn't myself take a photograph of this image and put it up online. Uh, the, the copyright cutoff for a lot of published material is 1923. Otherwise, there's kind of a cutoff of 40 years after someone's death. But none of these were really a, a concern here. Um, because these events happened so long ago, um, there was nothing proprietary about a lot of this material, especially the newspaper reports and um, public government records, court documents, and that kind of thing. So being a lover of, of road trips and a lover of spreadsheets, I, uh, I got a little bit of funding. And, in two th and when I say a little bit, I mean uh, $3,000 or so um, to build something that is now used worldwide. Uh, so in 2015, I took to the road and drove 7,500 miles around America. Uh, stopped at 25 different institutions across the country, small historical societies, major uh, institutions like the Newbury Library, um, to really try to find everything that I could about these events. Some of this was quite easy, so I was able to use Bill Tuttle's uh, biography and, and end notes um, to see what were the sources that he was using back in 1960, building his case about the Chicago riots. Um, looking at, there's a great writer who did a piece on the Knoxville riots as well as the Omaha riots, looking at what material they were looking at within their regions, um, but ultimately was able to track down, um, I'll, I'll show you a, a few of the images that have always stuck out to me over the past couple of years, um, but I do want to warn you that there are some graphic images here, um, so if you are, if, if scenes of death and violence um, bother you, which, which they should, uh, please do uh, maybe leave for a moment and come back. On the left is a picture of Longview, Texas. Um, as was the case in many of these events across the country in 1919, African-Americans were often rounded up, um, often by a large white mob, armed mob. And in many cases, the African-Americans had their guns taken away from them as you can see in the image here, while there are a couple of um, handguns and revolvers and things in the front, the majority of these guns are hunting guns. These are rural families living out in Texas. These were guns that they used for their livelihood, for their family's protection. Um, and when the race riots began to happen, especially as they grew and spread across the country, there was this fear of African Americans um, in an uprising against local landowners and things. And so um, the confiscation of guns was something that you saw across the nation again and again that summer. On the right is an image from Omaha, Nebraska. This is Willie Brown lynched by a mob of, they say between three and 5,000 in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, he was broken out of jail. The jail was dynamited um, to get him out of the jail to then lynch him in a public square. This idea of um, kind of this perceived justice by the mob that they were not gonna wait for the legal system to do anything um, 
so many of the riots this year involved people being broken out of jail to then be um, killed, if not attacked, in the streets. Um, so Omaha, the crowd involved women and children. The mayor was uh, tried to break in and stop the mob and stop the lynching of Willie Brown. The crowd then took a noose and put it around the mayor's neck and hung him up as well. Um, the mayor was cut down, but he was in a coma for quite a, a long time period. Uh, Willie Brown was not so lucky. Um, so it, it turns out he wasn't even the man they were looking for. It was just that they broke into the jail and any black man would do. Um, this was something else that you saw again and again in the Red Summer. On the left here um, is one of the documents that I later came across in Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, so I first heard about the events in 2014 or 13, but 2015 came across this document. It's from Maurice Mays. If you can see here, it's written from the death chamber. Um, he was put on trial for um, attacking a white woman. Uh, her name was Birdie something. It's been a while, I'm not sure if I remember her name. Um, it later turns out he's likely not the guy. There's mounting evidence that he's not the guy. The attacks continue after he's in jail and yet they've sentenced him to death. Um, partially because his attacks then um, spurred riots across the city and violence and destruction. Um, and so this is him begging the governor um, to put a stay to the execution. Um, Willie Mays, what, or Willie Mays, uh, uh, Maurice Mays, sorry about that, uh, was a wealthy African-American business owner. Um, he was also known to date quite a few white women in town, including the wife of the local police chief. All of this rubbed people the wrong way and um, likely uh, was one of the reasons that um, they ended up putting him to death without really any evidence. On the right um, is involved with uh, the Elaine Arkansas massacre from that summer, called a massacre because there's likely two to 300 African-American sharecroppers that were killed in Elaine, Arkansas for organizing or demanding better pay for, uh, for their crops um, to the landowners, many of which were descendants of the same families that owned the descendants of the sharecroppers as slaves. Um, this is generational inequality in this, um, in the kind of Delta region of, of Mississippi. And finally on the bottom, a political cartoon from Chicago, Illinois, um, that shows kind of an imaginary line being crossed in the water. In Chicago that summer, right around July 4th, there was an African-American teenager uh, who was stoned to death for floating into what was considered to be white water. There was a black beach and a white beach. He floated into what would have been white waters of Lake, Lake Michigan, and the crowd on the beach ended up stoning him to death. Um, this spurred riots across the city. While this was kind of the instigating factor, there was issues with labor and housing and there was um, bombings throughout the city that summer of black housing and businesses. Um, so it was not completely related to this event, but this was um, the event that spurred it. And so everything that I collected that summer I ended up building into a digital archive. So I collected over 700 documents that summer. Uh, Photographs, news clippings, cartoons, memorabilia, meeting minutes from places like the Urban League or the NAACP who were in their early years still at the time. And this is filterable too. So uh, researchers can use this and look by just documents from one particular city or they could look at just photographs or court documents maybe if they're a legal scholar. Um, there's different ways of sorting the material to make it useful. I also built a data set on the back end. So the more and more that I collected, I realized that a lot of these events had never been included in Red Summer data before. Um, there was sometimes confusion and a similar, uh, like one event would be called two or three different things by different people. The events would vary. And so I ended up trying to come to a kind of a definitive list of 
the events for the Red Summer. Um, and I use this to build an interactive timeline. So you can see kind of, this is just a screenshot, but you can see each of these little boxes here is a different city that summer. Um, as, you, whoop, as you move through time through the summer, um, you can see how they really increase um, leading into the fall. So ultimately, uh, I think when I first started, there was somewhere between like 26 and 29 red summer uh, incidents of violence that were known. Uh, we are now up to four dozen. And I really thought that, that we were done. So I finished this in 2015. Um, I put the interactive map and the timeline up on the website, um, was able to use this data set to look at trends and really thought, uh, you know, that, that my work was done, so to speak. Um, I did very little, uh, or really no advertising for this event. Um, spoke about it at a few conferences, sent out a couple of emails, but I'm now on track to have over 200,000 unique logins um, and likely closer to half a million users across the country. Um, you'll see here, I just took a screenshot today of where uh, different people are being brought to the site from this week. And so I have people at uh, University of Colorado, Illinois State, Ramapo, uh, Washington University, St. Louis, St. Olaf, Pratt, um, Ohio State, even someone here at, at uh, main.edu that seems to be using it. So um, I kind of figured that uh, university scholars would use it and potentially use it in the classroom, but I've really been surprised with how many high school classrooms are using it as well. So I hear from uh, teachers every few weeks about the way that their students are using the material to connect with the modern day. So as I said, I thought I was done. This summer during quarantine, I needed to find a particular file for something completely different. And I went to this bowl that I keep in my office that I should not be admitting to this, but I have six or seven flash drives in there. Who knows when they're all from? Some have names on it like this. So I know that this is from the Arkansas History Commission. Um, but ultimately, if I need to find an old file and it's not on my computer, it sometimes takes me plugging in a few different flash drives to find what I'm looking for. In doing so this summer, I found a file that when I was collecting material, um, I didn't save with all of the rest of the material, but I, for some reason, saved one individual file elsewhere on that same flash drive. Uh, so I was in 2015 at the Tuskegee Institute and they kept really detailed files of lynchings and other attacks that year um, that were mainly just newspaper clippings. Um, and so I, within one sitting, I think I had six hours there, within one sitting, had to photograph or clip on uh, microfilm, uh, I think, you know, 150 items or something within one sitting. And I was doing it so quickly that I'm kind of not surprised that I missed one item. And in a way it feels kind of meant to be because the one item that I was missing was related to a red summer incident right here on campus in Orono. Uh, so this was uh, the clipping that I had saved at the Tuskegee Institute was from the Chicago Defender. Um, and so all I initially had to go on was the information in this article, which had quite a number of things wrong, but ultimately led me to the right story. So that summer, or that actually that spring, technically, we call it the red summer, but um, usually April through October is the time period that we talk about. So in April of that year, um, in the middle of the night, two or three in the morning, I believe, uh, a group of 60 freshmen attacked the dorm room in Hannibal Hamlin Hall of Roger and Samuel Courtney. Um, the Courtney brothers were able to fight back, but they injured three of the freshmen in the scuffle. Um, they escaped, which infuriated the crowd. So this mob of 60 then grew to numerous hundreds. Um, the mob split up into three different groups. So there was one manhunt going to Bangor, one around Orono, and one looking for the brothers in Old Town. 
they did eventually find the brothers in Old Town. They uh, put livestock harnesses around their necks, led them back to campus uh, with this around their necks, uh, walked the four miles or so back to campus surrounded by this mob and were brought to the livestock arena on campus, which is now known as Cyrus Pavilion. Um, so you can see inside here, if you're familiar with the building, it's kind of uh, hexagonal. And so you can see they're on the inside of the livestock pavilion where they would normally be showing cows and horses and things. They were forced to uh, take off all of their clothes, slop each other with hot molasses. And then the crowd took presumably feathers from dorm room pillows uh, and feathered the boys there at what was then five or six in the morning. But if you can imagine mid to late April, uh, five or six in the morning in Maine is likely, you know, no warmer than freezing temperature. Um, it's, I think there's a variety of potential reasons why this could have happened. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but piecing together this story was quite hard. It wasn't something that the university wanted known. There was no mention of it in the main campus other than a letter to the editor that made reference to an announcement that the president at the time had made, um, but there was no article in the main campus completely left out of the Bangor Daily News, the Portland Press Herald. Um, I was fortunate in, in that I have access to a lot of different African-American newspapers that are not widely uh, available and was able to use this information from the Chicago Defender um, paired with historic yearbooks and other university records that the folks at Fogler helped me track down uh, and was able to piece together this story, which then led to one of the librarians at Fogler saying, well, this all sounds very familiar. I feel like I've seen a picture of this somewhere before. Um, and they were able to go back through and there was uh, former students papers that were donated who was a student during the teens, uh, Seth Pinkham. And this photograph was included in his papers um, from his time as a student. On the right here is their father. And normally I wouldn't mention someone's parents but Samuel Courtney Sr. was a very well-known African-American leader. Um, he was the head of the National Medical Association, uh, the president of the Negro Business League. He was a very close advisor and friend to Booker T. Washington. Um, he was a physician in Boston, quite wealthy. The boys went to the top schools in Boston. Uh, they were quite light-skinned to the point where often in society the family could pass, um, but it was very well known. Uh, you know, in the circles of people that knew them, uh, that they were African American. Uh, they're very proud of their heritage. Um, the father, especially, was very vocal in um, making a name for himself as um, as a doctor and business leader, and and actually for a while a politician during the Reconstruction era when the boys were were young, and even shortly before uh, the sons were were born. Uh, but other than a handful of newspaper articles in African American newspapers and this single photograph, this was something that was swept under the rug. It's not included in any campus history. It's never been written about in books. It's definitely never been included in red summer data before. And there's a variety of reasons that might happen. Um, you know, obviously, this is not something worth celebrating in a campus history. But even from the other perspective, um, from the perspective of the Courtney brothers, um, just out of trauma and shame, this is not something that, um, that I imagine that they would have passed down to their families. Um, I'm, this is still a very new discovery for me. So I'm working quite hard at tracking down descendants of the Courtney brothers. Um, I've made it through the 1960s and, and, um, and now have hit a little bit of a brick wall that will require me traveling to Boston. So I'm hoping once things lighten up to be able to, to add more to this story. But I mentioned there's some similarities here. Um, you know, a lot of people have asked me, well, why do you consider this to be a Red Summer event? There's so many similarities between this and other events that summer. Um, number one is the victim blaming. 
Um, I mentioned that there was a brief statement that I was able to come across from the president at the time, uh, President Ailey. He basically, it, his statement basically came down to, well, what do they do to deserve it? Um, and which is something that you would see time and time again. Yes, they were attacked, but we're gonna ignore the attackers. And instead, do you know that 10 years ago, so-and-so had this minor infraction that we should now bring up? Um, this idea of mob justice, as I mentioned, this kind of inappropriate extrajudicial response. Um, the only wording that I've ever found to describe why this happened to the Courtney brothers was that they were ill-tempered. <laughs> which is often the kind of words that you would hear to describe any African-Americans who really attained any sort of uh, notoriety. These boys were at the top of their class. They played football. They were World War I soldiers. They dated white women. They were very much popular at UMaine, um, but definitely not with everybody. Uh, this is held a lot of similarities in the fact that it was kept out of local press, um, but those in the African American press were very much aware of this event, especially because of the notoriety of the father. Um, and the final big similarity um, is that there was a lack of response from law enforcement. You know, there's a mob of anywhere between four and 600 people roaming the streets and, and, the, and for hours and leading these uh, African-American men back to campus. And yet the police show up like a half an hour after everything is done. It's, you know, it goes on for numerous hours and the police show up after everything is, has kind of been finalized. Um, this is something that we see time and time again, that if there is any response at all, that it's either after the fact or that there's some sort of support or alignment with the mob and not with the victims. Um, this, these are similarities that you see again today. Um, this was one of the first major incidents where you really saw kind of a militarization of the police as well. And so there was tanks and machine guns used against citizens in Knoxville and Chicago and other cities. Um, and really, if you were to try to fight back against that, you were seen as an agitator. Um, you were often arrested, you were labeled a communist. Um, and so for me, 101 years later, this all sounds so familiar. Um, attacks against African-Americans continue. Um, any organizing and protesting um, in the name of social justice is, is, is seen as um, kind of contrary to being American, which is uh, just mind boggling, mind -boggling to me. Um, but really looking at the parallels that happen again and again and again. I mean, 1919 is just one year, but with, you know, many people are familiar with uh, the events in Tulsa or the Wilmington massacre of 1898 um, of riots in the 60s. I mean, these parallels and similarities between why people protest, how they protest, how that protest is seen um, is just something that, that is circular. Um, and it's something that's really everywhere. The Red Summer is kind of seen as an urban problem, um, but being able to locate it here on campus in a small town um, that didn't have a lot of the same um, kind of powder keg factors that some of the urban environments had, that there still very much um, was this kind of violence against African-Americans in Maine. I know we don't like to think of that um, as being part of Maine's history, Luckily, the university now um, has responded much more appropriately than they did 101 years ago. Uh, so President Farini Mundi made a statement back in September about my research, saying that there is much in Humane's past which we can all be truly proud, but we cannot shy away from confronting and atoning for our university's more painful moments. So I'm hoping to use this event as an opportunity um, to work with students to look at this and other hidden histories on campus. Uh, so I'm working with a few students in Liam Rudin's public history class, History 311, uh, to build an interactive map and social media campaign around what stories aren't being told about campus. Um, and they don't necessarily have to be 
violent, shameful events like this, um, but better highlighting when was the first Native American student on campus? What year did they first attend? Who was the first female faculty member? Um, were there any uh, strikes or issues around labor history that we can maybe highlight of UMaine's workers through the years? Um, we, I know that one of the students is looking at kind of a queer history of campus and different student groups throughout the years and how they've been impactful. Um, one of the other students is looking at UMaine's role as a land grant university. So they're finding ways to take stories around campus and physically attach them to buildings. Um, so we're hoping that in the spring, this will be um, both a digital walking tour as well as hopefully a distanced uh, outdoor tour uh, if able. Um, but hoping to use this as a springboard to, to start to get students to ask other questions. You know, I think we think of campuses as these neutral places, but in reality, uh, you know, not just the events that happen here, but campuses are very much places where history, you know, is not only studied, but it's actively changed and adapted and at times hidden and erased. Uh, and I think this is just the, the perfect moment within the university's uh, movement towards being a more uh, socially just and equitable campus um, to really look at events like this and figure out how we can acknowledge uh, the difficulty and the shame of events like that, but use them, use them for good and, um, and use them as an opportunity. Um, so I'm excited in the next few weeks here, I'll be seeing what students come up with. So I just kind of have a rough idea right now, um, but I was inspired by friends at UNC who did a similar project around uh, Silent Sam, uh, the statue and various building renamings there uh, that very much align with what UMaine is going through right now with the renaming of Little Hall. So I'm hoping if I have a moment here, uh, that I'm going to do a quick demo. Looks like we're doing okay on time. So the website that I built, uh, Visualizing the Web Sub the Red Summer, has a variety of different components. And so the timeline here, if you're just kind of hoping to better understand the Red Summer and what it was all about, I think the timeline is the best entry point. Um, so as you move through the year, you can see the first events in April, the event in Orono being one of the first that summer. But each and every one of these bars is a different city, a different event, a different document featured. Um, but I find that this just gives you a little snippet of that particular city's events. Um, but by going through the whole timeline, you can kind of have a better idea of some of the themes that arise again and again. I also use that data to build a map. And if you click on the image here, it should take you in there. All of these data sets are filterable. So the initial screen um, is just sorting by types of violence. So where, where were lynchings more popular versus riots? Lynchings definitely were very much more a Southern thing. Riots more so in the North. But there's other ways if you wanted to look at what were the most violent riots. Um, so I'm gonna unselect everything here. Uh, look at locations in which more than 10 people were killed. There was only two cities where that happened. So the majority of the violence that was happening, it was just a few people in each city killed. But then comparing that to number injured, um, some of these cities really had hundreds and hundreds of people that ended up in the hospital um, from these fights that were happening in the streets. There's also a way of sorting it by themes. Um, so this idea that black men are a threat to white women was something that spurred quite a lot of these incidents that summer. And part of that was due to these tropes and uh, things that were coming up again and again, and not just birth of a nation, but kind of in popular culture and society at the time, there was this, this picture of the dangerous black man and the white woman. And most of these relationships were legitimate relationships between these people, but to outsiders, it was worthy of, of being attacked in the street. And so uh, like that one in particular, more than a third of the events that summer were related in, in some respect to um, black men and white women being together in the same place. 
Um, if you're interested in just the government response, which ones had troops called in? Um, and it's you know a little bit less than a third, so this is roughly roughly a quarter of the events that summer. There were also um, a lot of bombings of homes and churches, and quite a lot of the lynchings uh, and shootings happened at churches themselves. So this was one of the trends that I had not noticed previously in Red Summer data, um, but particularly in Georgia. Um, there should be a few more that are popping up. I'm not sure why they aren't. Um, but I think I identified five or six that happened in churches, um, but most were in Georgia. And then the big thing is the archive. And so this was really where the bulk of the work went. Uh, as I mentioned, there's over 700 documents that I've added so far, but I have quite a number of other documents that I've identified across the country that I just need to get to, uh, as well as similar events that happened elsewhere. And so we always look at the Red Summer as, as a strictly American thing, but there was race riots happening in Great Britain, in Australia, in Canada. Um, and there's now a few scholars, there's one at Duke who I'm not remembering, who I think is doing the connection to, uh, to Great Britain, but I, I might be wrong about that. But uh, this was um, not strictly an urban American problem. Um, this is something that was really kind of happening worldwide after the end of the war. Uh, so this too is filterable. So you can sort by location of violence and then go to filter options and all of the different cities that had riots. So if you wanted to see everything that I had on you know, Norfolk, Virginia or Wilmington, Delaware, Youngstown, Ohio, you could look at just those documents. Uh, but there's also ways of sorting by theme, sorting by document type. Um, maybe you're just interested in meeting minutes or photographs or political cartoons. Uh, there's ways of, of looking at just those things. Uh, so telegrams, for instance. Um, so there's a handful of different telegrams um, from Chicago, Illinois, and DC that especially kind of show the immediacy of, of how local politicians reacted to these events in real time and, and communicated back and forth about whether to call in the troops or, um, or make any kind of overarching decisions about how to react. Um, so this is something that will kind of grow and evolve. I call it a rogue archive because this is something I just created with, with an iPhone camera and when they would allow me a scanner. Um, it's not, it, to, to make a traditional archive that would include all of these same things with 25 different institutions would take years of planning and likely like a million dollars and countless meetings and um, things that I'm able to get away with doing it cheaply, like crooked photos that are sometimes blurry. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's always a, a cheaper, easier, uh, faster fix sometimes. It might not be as pretty. Uh, it might not be the way that, uh, that a traditional archivist might have done it, um, but ultimately I was able to get the same material out there um, for, for almost no money and, and have been able to watch the impact that that has had. Um, you know, I built this not knowing if anyone would ever use it. I thought maybe a handful of people would, and um, it just kind of shows uh, the need to be able to access historic documents like this. Um, and especially as, as these parallels continue to happen a year, a uh, hundred years later, um, I think making that access um, more widely known is more important now than ever. So I'm hoping to open it up for a, for a Q and A and possibly a discussion. I don't know if we have any questions. And, okay, I see Eileen has a question. Yeah, uh, it's her husband Joe. Um, a couple of two very quick questions. One is, uh, no doubt, with these riots have in common is virulent racism. Um, but what about the idea that many of the people who join felt left out of the of modernity, of the modern changes that were taking place, and therefore expressed their anger 
uh, you know, racially and otherwise through the, these means. Um, so that's one question. And the other question is, main, my wife is writing, an, is in the process of writing an article about the Underground Railroad in Maine. But um, what she's come up with is the thesis that uh, while Maine prides itself on a certain kind of liberalism, uh, anti-slavery, abolition, uh, uh, there, there was significant pro-slavery sentiment uh, and that persistence of virulent racism, which goes back a long ways. And I, I just uh, thought maybe you can comment on some of that. Yeah, I mean, especially your first comment. Uh, a lot of times these riots between African-Americans and whites were, uh, were people from the lower class. I mean, these were the people that were uh, fighting for the same housing, the same jobs. Um, you know, this wasn't upper class white society that was that was creating this violence. It really was those that kind of felt threatened. Um, that after the war, especially, um, so during the war, a lot of these men left their jobs, um, were then uh, killed by African Americans, by immigrants, by women, um, and then to return home from war there was kind of you know, most of these events were very male very testosterone driven very driven um and so you know ultimately no matter what racism was a cause i think if you asked any of them if that was the reason that they were doing it likely not but but i think looking at where a lot of these things came from um, chicago for instance a lot of the white gangs that were instigating this violence across the city were immigrant groups. So it was Polish gangs and Lithuanian gangs and Bohemian gangs and Italian gangs that lived in these neighborhoods that butted up against the African-American neighborhoods. Right. So all of these bombings and things across the city um, were based on this, um, this structure in the city that segregated people, but uh, forced them into these areas together at the same time. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I had a question. Um, it's in regard to uh, what you're talking about, like women and um, how the lynchings were relating to uh, white women. And I can't help but think about how the progressive movement at the time, um, you know, women were advancing in society and the, um, you know, getting their voting rights and, and all these, you know, progressive movements that are happening at the time. I'm wondering, um, Professor Manning at Loyola had, had said in his class that Lint, uh, you know, inter, interracial um, relationships were outlawed and not just to control black men, but to control women as well. I'm wondering if you ever came across um, something that linked the two, like, just, and just called it out in any of your research? Yeah, no, I'm trying to think of anything that was specifically related to local laws or anything. The only one that I'm thinking of offhand was a smaller incident in uh, Newberry, South Carolina. Um, the man was literally arrested for writing a love letter uh, to a woman and he had asked another white woman to like give it to her friend and that was enough, according to local law, uh, for him to be arrested, which then led to, to riots and other things. But uh, yeah, no, and I think people are often unaware of laws like that, especially in areas like Maine or, I mean, I lived in the South for years. And so like things like Jim Crow laws, very familiar with in the South, but like I think people in the North are for the most part, not aware of uh, like sundown towns or other ways in which, African Americans were um, by law segregated and um, that didn't quite look the same as, as Jim Crow in the South, but uh, definitely the controlling of women's bodies. I, I totally agree, Sammy, that it's very much as much a control of, of the women as it is of the men. Um, and I think a lot of that is, 
harkening back to times of slavery and one drop rule and that kind of thing. Um, you know, this this is the height of of birth of a nation and um, and of this idea of white female purity and protecting the race and that kind of thing. And so it very much was a policing of of white women as well. Um, and not just bodies. Um, so like the Chicago and the Elaine riots in particular, um, Ida B. Wells was uh, in her journalism days at the time and wrote a lot about it. Um, quite a lot of the people that were outspoken at this time were uh, female progressives. Um, and especially in urban environments um, that uh, that were kind of at the center of, I mean, if you look at where a lot of these riots were happening, like Sammy's a Chicagoan I know, so like there, a lot of them are happening like not so far from Hull House. <laughs> um, and so it's these neighborhoods that are um, where all different cultures are very much kind of thrown together into um, this kind of matchbox, uh, Cult, uh, not culture, but uh, it's it's very much just this way of life in certain neighborhoods at the time for decades where there just was this tension that was very much a part of everyday life. Um, and it's not something that we, it's harder to see in places like here in Maine, um, but in the urban environment, this wasn't, you know, all of the Red Summer events were spurred by a singular event, but this was decades worth of tensions going on. Any other questions? We have a few minutes to go. I had a question, if that's okay. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Okay, great. Um, I was wondering, um, I know maybe I missed this. You said there wasn't much information about sort of the, the actual violence on the campus there or no, but and I was looking at the picture and I was trying to see, are, are those students, was it mainly a student led or were those men in the town or was it a, a combination? Um, I, I'm interested because I write about historically white sororities as well as fraternities and um, I'm just I just looked up Seth Pinkham and he has a fraternity relationship so I was sort of curious if you ran across anything um, related to Greek organizations in this sort of leading an uprising or if it was just overall student hazing which happens I know with some classes anyway. Yeah um, as far as I can tell it seems to be just student hazing, although others have made, if I showed you a larger version of that photograph, um, a lot of the boys are wearing identical beanies of some sort. And so I do wonder if there is some sort of connection there. Michael, were you the one to bring up the beanie connection? Might've been someone else. Um, but, uh, and quite a lot of the people in the background are also wearing soldiers clothing. Um, and so I think a lot of these are Maybe they are fellow students, but they are also fellow soldiers. Uh, both of the Courtney boys served uh, in the colored troops at the time uh, and were um, in a special uh, regiment of humane students that was uh, just African American students as well. Uh, and yeah, it's piecing together the story was, was a little hard and we're still kind of finding the details, but it seems that the initial group of 60 was all freshmen but by the time that it grew to four or 500, that it was quite a number of community members. Um, I found one mention of faculty members being involved, but nothing really to verify that story. Um, but there's definitely an age variance in, in the photos that I've seen. Um, so it might've started as campus event, but I think um, as it grew and kind of spread to these other communities, I mean, if it was four in the morning and you saw 200 people walking down the street, wouldn't you say, hey, what are you doing? What are you up to? And I, uh, you know, I think that likely a lot of those people involved were completely unaware of the original situation or anything and were just kind of swept up in this mob mentality um, without necessarily even having the specifics. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Karen. So I guess my question is twofold. Um, so I'm thinking of coming from Illinois, I'm thinking about uh, the connection in uh, 
the Red Summer events in Chicago as with Orono. Um, and I guess the question is, uh, the first one is, did your work uh, involve the events that happened in universities in Chicago or just the city more generally? Um, I only found one other incident of Red Summer violence at a university at all. Um, and that was in New London, Connecticut. Um, and it was very minor, um, definitely not to this level. Otherwise, as far as I can tell, none of the Chicago violence involved uh, college students. For the most part, as I mentioned earlier, it was a lot of working class people um, that were involved. Uh, and so, but at the same time, it did involve youth in Chicago. And so I think that's, that's definitely a major similarity there. But, um, but yeah, it definitely played out a lot differently. Um, I know there are colleges in Chicago right now that are using my data um, to be able to even build that local story more. Uh, so John Clegg, who's at the University of Chicago, worked with him last year. Uh, he used my data set to then build these really detailed maps of Chicago with like heat maps and that kind of thing. So you can see where these little eruptions of violence were because um, I built a data set of um, all of the arrests and injuries and the addresses of all of the people that were arrested. And so you're able to kind of see exactly how it played out within the city. Um, and, and he's got much better digital humanities skills than I, than I do. So uh, he was able to kind of really bring that local Chicago story to light. No, I, um, I'll, I'll definitely look into that. Um, as part two of this question, as, as it played out differently, did you find that the, the events that did take place were more violent or um, more dangerous in an urban setting than in a rural setting? Um, I mean, the very, the very most violent event, um, I think that at the time in the Elaine, Arkansas region, there was maybe like 1500 total African-American residents and more than 200 were massacred during the events in Elaine, Arkansas. Uh, and so that was very much rural. It was um, sharecroppers living in the middle of nowhere being rounded up by, uh, by armed military members. Um, but for the most part, the mobs and that kind of violence really was far worse uh, in the urban areas. Most of the rural events were like, you know, 10 or 12 bystanders, that kind of thing. Um, the Orono event is by far the largest mob in a rural area that I've come across. Um, I was just comparing all of the data last week um, and it was um, definitely one of, one of the largest mobs uh, for the smallest populations. Thank you. I see Anila has a question too. Yes, hi, Karen. Thank you so much. This was so uh, informative. And so uh, my question, I guess, is I'm curious, did the Courtney brothers then uh, go on to graduate from UMaine is my first question, you know, and I keep, I can't, I keep thinking, so that incident happened, like how do you wake up the next day and like go to the dining hall or like go to class? And so, and if, you know, based on what you mentioned that, you know, I wonder if a lot had to be done to keep it away, keep it from getting some attention and, um, you know, media coverage. Do you think that there may have been sort of hush, like reparations in some way? Uh, I mean, I'm curious to know if you found some, like, hey, we're going to do scholarships or, um, I don't know, you know, how did that sort of white guilt placate itself? Yeah, and it did not. Um, up until the president's recent apology to the Courtney brothers, uh, the university never dealt with this. Um, I find conflicting reports about what happened to the brothers afterwards. Um, most initial reports say that they were asked to leave, that they didn't just leave campus after the, this event, but that the Courtney brothers themselves were asked to leave while no punishment was given to the attackers. 
Um, so I will mention that there's a third Courtney brother. There was actually three brothers attending UMaine at the same time. The third brother, Horace Courtney, did graduate in 1920 or 1921 in textile chemistry um, and ended up having like a long-term girlfriend that lived somewhere kind of around the Bangor area. So he would be up from Boston often. Um, but he passed, all three Courtney brothers passed away in their 20s. Only one ever had a child. Um, and because, so census records, uh, 1900s through 1920s would list a family like the Court Courtney's as mulatto, um, as mixed race. But by 1940s, um, the Courtney brother or the Courtney family in Boston census records are now listed as white. And oftentimes this is just the census taker not asking, just, just assuming, seeing the family, writing down the names, the dates, but not asking the question, what is your race? Um, and part of this might have been the family though self-claiming as white, but I, I really kind of doubt that knowing the history of the family and their connection to kind of black progress and, and pride. Um, so I, I kind of doubt that, but uh, I, there's conflicting reports about whether, so I know that uh, Roger Courtney never returned to school. Samuel Courtney, I do find mention of him in the 1920 yearbook as um, I think like a member of Glee Club, but he also might, his name just might be left over from the previous year's list. It seems to be almost copied and pasted from the yearbook the year prior, but I don't find any record that anyone besides Horace graduated. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question. Um, did they happen to die in their 20s from acts of further violence against them? Was this like a repeated issue they faced? Um, not as far as I can tell. Um, so one was a car accident. The other one was technically a car accident, but it, the way that the article described it, it seems that um, possibly he was injured during the war which then created some sort of invisible internal injury that then like erupted, which then caused him to have a car accident or something. Um, but it seemed that, uh, that one was a car accident and one was somehow related to the war, but uh, like 10 years later passing away from whatever that injury was. Um, and he had like crashed into a building through a storefront or something, but it turns out it was related to some other injury. Um, but no, as far as I can tell, uh, this was the only incident of violence against the brothers. Um, the, uh, the father was a graduate of Harvard. And so um, a few of the boys after their time at UMaine did some work, um, some events and things at Harvard related to uh, African-American athletes, um, both collegiate and professional. Um, and it seems that Roger in particular was um, quite well known um, as a supporter of uh, African-Americans in collegiate athletics. When they played for UMaine, you know, so they're playing on an integrated team from 1917, I think 1917 is when the boys joined the team. Um, and so this was a fairly early integrated team in the big scheme of college sports. Um, and a few of the brothers went on um, a little bit in sports, it seemed like in the Boston area after that. I went on a tangent there that started with an answer to your question and, and went on a tangent there. Thank you. Any last questions before we wrap up? Okay. Thank you very much, Karen. And, and I wanna thank the uh, Office of Diversity and Inclusion also for co-sponsoring this. And uh, we look forward to seeing, can you, can you just uh, conclude this, finish off by telling us what your it, the future plans for this research here uh, that you have right now? Uh, yeah. Where will we see it in print is one way of asking. <laughs> Uh, working on a piece for the conversation right now um, that I hope will be published within a couple of weeks. Um, I uh, 
think that I'm working on a, a short piece for U University of Illinois Press that'll be uh, combined with some other things. Um, but who knows? Um, I do hope to, you know, it's weird as an academic to really, so my focus here in building this was not necessarily to do research myself or not necessarily to make a name for myself as a race scholar because, because I'm not. Um, that is not my area of specialty. Um, this was really something that I started out of frustration of not being able to find material that I knew had to be out there. Um, and so, you know, normally publishing and getting it out there would be would be a goal for my personal, uh, you know, expansion in my career. But ultimately, my goal with this is getting it into the hands of as many members of the public as possible. Um, so that you know, every single time I have a conversation with somebody new and I talk about doing research on the Red Summer, 95% of the time, nobody's ever heard of the Red Summer. So my goal in this is, is not necessarily to publish or to come up with new scholarship, but to, to really um, spread the word about this and other hidden events in, in American history that most Americans just weren't taught about and being able to connect them with the actual historic documents that tell the stories themselves. Um, you know, I think if it's, you know, academic texts and things are fantastic, especially for us academics, but I think for the general public, um, taking all of that same information from a book and repackaging it in a different way that's more accessible to the public um, to increase awareness about events like this is, is important. Um, but maybe I'll publish more about it in the future. Well, we'll look for that article. Thank you so much, Karen, and thank you everybody for joining us tonight.